He gets it out deep, and Havlicek steals it over his bad goal. Between 1957 and 1966, the Celtics won nine NBA titles. It seemed their wisecracking coach, Red Auerbach, always was and always would be courtside. I think Red Auerbach was the greatest coach in the history of the game and also the best individual in management in the history of the NBA. First he starts with the Russell era, turns it over, gets Cowens, turns it over, Bird. I don't think anybody's ever going to match that. Certainly no one is likely to ever match Auerbach's habit of lighting a cigar whenever he smelled victory. I get a call one time, the commissioner. He says, you can't smoke cigars on the bench. I said, what is this, an airplane? That's the original taunt. What's a bigger trash talk than a cigar? You know, this one's over. You guys stay out there and play. I'm thinking about the next game. It was really it, a sense of arrogance. I loved it. A guy sitting on the bench with a cigar, a little guy, everybody towering above him. He's yelling and screaming, getting them to play together, get all of these egos to play together. I mean, the man was a genius. His philosophy always was, don't be someone who adjusts to another team. Make them adjust to you. And he said, be an instigator instead of a retaliator. Instigation was one of Red's natural-born talents. In the 1957 playoffs against St. Louis, Auerbach complained that one of the baskets was too low. A fight broke out with Hawks owner Ben Kerner. And I saw Red hit uh, Kerner uh, with, the, with the fist in the face. And Red decked him. They dragged the owner of the Hawks off the floor. And that was before the game started. We never instigated this stuff, believe me. Guilty or not, Auerbach was known to play head games with the opposition. His team always stood during timeouts. That tells you as a player that you don't get tired. So if you can stand up doing timeouts and that other team over there sitting down, they're looking at you, then you're going to have the psychological edge on them. L.A. used to complain that Red Auerbach deliberately turned the water off in the shower after the game. Then they used to object that the building was so hot. We did it on purpose. Before the game, you'd be ushered into your locker room, which was slightly bigger than the closet. And somehow or another, somebody, just by chance, had left all the radiators on all night. It was 110 degrees in there. And just by chance, the windows wouldn't open. We'd come out to shoot around, and the lights would be on halfway, and our baskets were kind of different. Teams would come in and complain about the floor in the locker room, or this or that or the other. but. Red used that. As long as that affected them and gave us a competitive edge, I'd go along with it. i said, yeah, sure, I did that. it have been stupid, but they fell for that nonsense. He lived his whole life like this, you know. His ethics were those of convenience. He was like a spitball pitcher. Maybe he's doing it, maybe he's not, but if the hitters think he's doing it, there's an edge there. Reserving his most brilliant psychology for his own players, Red's so-called sixth man was a successful application of the power of positive thinking. When you get five guys that walk out on the court, that get all the love, the spotlight, everybody acknowledges they're supposed to be the best because they're starting. But there's one guy, maybe two guys sitting there, saying, I'm just as good as they are. As usual, when things get rough, Coach Red out back calls on his clutch man, Frank Ramsey. Red created the sixth man, and it became such an effective tool for getting that guy to get the feeling that he was appreciated, not a destructive force, a very important player. The master manipulator. This was Red Auerbach after a game. He walked over to JoJo White and said, JoJo, I'm just so bright outside. Boy, that son of yours getting big. JoJo be happy. He walked over to Dave Cowan. He said, big red to give him a cigar. Dave is happy. He walked over to Paul Sowers and said, Paul Sowers. And Paul Sowers said, Head. And Paul is happy. The best person I've ever been around in managing men was Red Arbach. Red knew how to interject fear. You know, you guys are not diving for loose balls. I hope you've paid the mortgages on your homes. Training camp, I can recall the first couple of days, all we did was run. The fast break is a running type game and demands real strength and stamina. He had like Lombardi torture drills. He would put us running through these drills backwards, forwards. I mean, we'd run sideways. Though his teams made the playoffs in each of the first 10 years as head coach, Auerbach never won a title. 
But his fortunes would change when he masterminded a deal to get Bill Russell, the second pick of the 1956 NBA draft. With Bob Cousy in the backcourt, Red had the cornerstones to his dynasty. Cousy brought to the game the kind of excitement the Globetrotters had built their fame and fortune on, and bringing in new passing and ball handling skill. Russ enabled us to become even more effective with this transition game because he literally controlled the defensive board. He was a good outletter, and then he added a dimension of defense uh, and shot blocking that had never been seen before. Bill Russell was content not to score. Now, he made his contribution by getting the ball. Al back engendered and created an atmosphere where we were all team players. Auerbach knew that in order to get the most out of the Celtics, he'd need to enlist Bill Russell. And the day before training camp, Red says, OK, Russ, you were great last year. You're going to be great this year. But here's my problem. He said, uh, I got to be all over you. Because you know why? Those other guys, they're going to wonder how I'm going to treat you now. So when we go out there, I want you to screw off a little bit. They made the deal. So he went out, first chance he got Red, stopped the practice, rustled, screamed and yelled. And of course, Russ had great dignity. <laughs> and Russ, because he gave his word, stood there and took it. But he told me, he says, I wanted to punch him right in the mouth. Auerbach was the perfect coach for Bill Russell. An American Jew from New York City, he understood the racial dynamics in blue-collar Irish Catholic Boston. Bill Russell was the first black athlete in Boston of any prominence. Red Auerbach became Bill Russell's John the Baptist. The greatest of them all. Red said, you know, Russ, he said, you're Afro-American, and that's new to this league. you got to wipe everybody out. To Al Bax Cutter, he funneled and handled this anger and this intensity. One season, they had five whites, five blacks, and a Jewish coach. And I never saw such a spree de corps or such pride in the team. We didn't see color. We saw W's. When Auerbach stepped down as coach, he handed the reins to Russell, the NBA's first black head coach. I theorized that at this stage of his career, who could better motivate Bill Russell than Bill Russell? Bill, this is a sensitive question, but it may need answering. As the first Negro coach of a major league sport, can you do the job impartially without any racial prejudice in reverse? Yes. As general manager, Auerbach carried on the dynasty. By drafting Dave Cowens, Larry Bird, and Kevin McHale, and trading for Robert Parrish and Bill Walton, he'd bring the Celtics another five NBA titles. Probably the key element is the authoritative figure at the top establishing a sense of family, a sense of loyalty, a sense of trust and responsibility amongst everybody in the family. What made it all happen for the Boston Celtics was Red Auerbach. He was shrewd enough and clever enough to figure out how to keep those guys together, compatible, and keep that edge. He kept the players hungry. I would consider Ed Auerbach a great coach, not only because he had so many victories, so many championships, which is the ultimate mark of the man, but because of the team that he built, the spirit that he built, the tradition that he built.